floor is mine. Okay, thank you. Oh. <laughs> Good evening everyone, my name is Helen Nicholson and I'm coming towards the end stages of my PhD thesis in the Department of Management and International Business. I have two uh, wonderful supervisors, Professor Brad Jackson and Dr. Bridget Carroll. So as I was preparing for this, this presentation, I realised that it would be misleading of me to craft my presentation in a way that depicted my research as following a linear, progressive stage of, of achievements. Rather, um, this word undoing, whilst it's relevant to my leadership development participants, is also relevant to the way that I see and feel research. It can be a thoroughly undoing process. This word undoing is an intricate one, and it has at least three layers of meanings. So on the one hand, undoing means to open up, to untie or release. It also means to discard or reverse. And at the more extreme end, it means bringing to ruination or to destroy. So as researchers, we hope to open up the mysteries of this world and feel the thrill in unravelling those ideas. But at times we feel the loss of having to let go our old, our old preconceptions and ideas. And at times it can bring us to our knees. So whilst uh, my topic today s speaks primarily about participants in leadership development programmes, I hope that some of you in the room will be able to relate to it and challenge it because undoing is an integral part of being involved in learning and discovery in universities. So my presentation today follows the feel more of an unfolding story and my story begins two and a half years ago. So two and a half years ago I was doing a summer research project with my soon to be um, supervisor Bridget Carroll. And as part of this project, I had to read through screeds and screeds of interview transcripts with people who had been on leadership development programs. And I was astonished at the amount of people who talked about themselves in the transcripts. There was a lot of self-talk in them. And I started to think, what is all this self-stuff for? So I turned to the leadership development literature in the hope that they would explain to me what was going on in leadership development programs but I kept being confronted with this assumption that organisations need to develop their leadership. It's necessary for, for an effective organisation. There didn't seem to be much critical, critical scrutiny about this relationship between the self and leadership development. So, um, the leadership development industry is an interesting one in the sense that it, it's estimated that approximately 50 billion US dollars are spent globally around the world in the pursuit of developing leadership. In this very in a university, we have two institutes and centres dedicated solely to the development of leadership, with many other initiatives in the wings. So it seemed bizarre to me that there wasn't this critical scrutiny, especially given that leadership development programs have been positioned as identity workspaces where um, participants are encouraged to work upon themselves, often with their organisation footing the bill. At the same time, there's researchers like Scott saying that these, um, these contexts in which identities are reconstructed haven't been paid enough attention to. So my thesis represents one attempt to try and halt the surging tide and demand for leadership development and instead ask what is being done in the name of it. So I started my PhD research with some guiding questions wanting to look at why um, identities were being brought into leadership development. What is the consequence of doing identity work in leadership development? Before I move on to my uh, research, I need to define two words I've used quite loosely. They're two very contested terms. So the first is this one, identity, and I'm using it more from a sociological perspective. So what identity means is, is that pursuit to answer that question, who am I, or who do I want to become? And it's often shifting, and for me, it's linguistic and social in nature. So it's not just something cognitive. I'm not using the psychological understanding of it. Identity work is the term that captures the endeavours we engage in when trying to answer that question. So I've highlighted these words because it shows that how we understand identity work has been framed in a particular way, and in a way that doesn't mention this idea of undoing. So those are the, those are the key terms I'm using today. 
So I started out um, going to Sweden actually to work with some of these identity researchers and to be raised in their particular research methodology when it comes to identity studies. So to, to use some convoluted academic terms, um, I'm following a social constructionist paradigm which is perhaps different from what we've heard so far today. And essentially what this means is that Researchers following this paradigm believe that there is not one objective reality out there that research seeks to uncover. Rather, the research process is more interested in how people come to understand their world, knowing that there are multiple subjective realities, of which the researcher has their own, so we're co-constructing knowledge. Most importantly, this paradigm pays an attention to language. So how is language used? Um, in my context for identity and leadership development. So I've done what I call a hybrid ethnography. So ethnography is that term for, for the days of old and researchers used to put on a safari suit and carry their notebook and go off to the colonies and try to figure out what the, um, what the savages were doing. So I'm doing it more in an organisational context. It's hybrid because on the one hand I'm doing traditional forms, I've observed people face to face, but it's virtual because I've been observing these participants in their online forum. So I've covered one leadership development program for the last 18 months I've been observing them. Um, there's 36 participants from across New Zealand from a diverse range of industries. To give you an idea of the amount of data I've got, I've got about 300 pages of field notes, 500 pages of their reflective journals and reflective writing, and 6,000 individual postings they've made to these online forums. So it's profuse. But the, one of the things that these Swedish researchers taught me is to try and look for breakdowns in understanding. So to try and look for moments where you think, that's just bizarre. So this genesis of undoing comes from the first residential, funnily enough, where I was observing participants. And they were talking about the nature of their leadership development experience so far. And one of them said, I feel like they've blown everything to smithereens. I've been cut apart. They've dissolved my foundations. It's shaken up everything I know. I say that it's bizarre because I really hadn't expected them to talk in quite destructive and violent terms, in terms of their identity. So I started to trace through my data these mentionings of identity destruction. But there was more going on. Participants felt the thrill of being opened up and learning more about themselves. Some of them relished this idea of letting go old identities which they felt had been holding them back, and others felt the loss of having to let go of those. So, I scoured the leadership development and identity literature, wondering perhaps, has this undoing been done? So, the leadership development literature and the identity from org studies literature tends to portray identity work in a particular way. And that is that in our pursuit to understand ourselves, we add new identities or add new aspects, we build, we construct. And once we get to that point, we maintain and protect who we are. The leadership development literature also assumes that people progress from stages of immaturity to maturity. Whilst this work has undoubtedly offered us some, some real advantages in this field of study, I started to wonder, isn't there more to identity work and leadership development than these movements? Particularly given that this word develop has etymological roots in the word developer, where des means to undo and developer means to wrap up. So it seemed to me that leadership development was looking more at this wrapping up process and not the undoing process, which seems to be implicit in the very word itself. So my thesis aims to temper this focus on wrapping up and develop, build, this idea of undoing. I then had to understand what this undoing word means. Shakespeare's famous for using it in Macbeth, what's done cannot be undone. Funnily enough, the org studies literature is silent on it. We don't seem to talk about it in my discipline. So I travelled to various fields, ending up looking at hippie culture and special forces and this crazy stuff. And I realised that there's about six different ways that undoing can be understood. Coming undone involves moments where we feel unsettled, opened up or destroyed. It also involves stripping back aspects of who we are, even reversing who we are, as Freud says, and then shedding aspects of ourselves. 
but it still didn't really hit on what I was trying to accomplish in my thesis until I found this one quote by an American scholar, Judith Butler. And she, she says, we're undone by each other. And if we're not, we're missing something. One does not always stay intact. It may be that one wants to or does, but it may also be that in despite one's best efforts, one is undone in the face of the other, by the touch, by the scent, by the feel, by the prospect of the touch, by the memory of the feel. Butler's quote is important because she picks up on some key themes in my research. On the one hand, she sees undoing as this coming apart of not staying intact. She references the undeniable relationality involved in becoming undone. We're undone by each other. It's not just a cognitive, internal, private process. She talks about the different ways we can respond to being undone. We try to resist it, despite one's best efforts, or we invite being undone, one wants to. Most importantly though, Butler says that if we're not being undone, we're missing a fundamental part of, human be of, of being a human. If we're not, we're missing something. So I propose that this quote and this work of Butler, although she's talking about loss and sexuality, cements my topic as a vital area to understand in greater depth for the leadership development literature. So finally, months after doing my research, my fieldwork, my data analysis, I had my research question, following that more inductive approach to research. I then had the, the joyful task of analyzing my thousands and thousands of pieces of paper. And in doing that, I was, I was doing a technique called discourse analysis, where I'm looking at the language participants use when they talk about their identity. And I'm also looking at how, I, uh, how language is used to undo them. So things like questioning or attacking or powerful language, how that can unravel you. So I've come up with six main, what we call discourses, six different ways that undoing can manifest in people. Some of these are more energizing, and the participants really relished and delighted in the opportunity to experience these. So participants talk of feeling loosened up, like they've been unfastened from a stuck position. They're able to move in more ways than, than prior to the program. They talk about how they've been shaken up, and one of them uses the metaphor of a glass um, snow dome. So it's a gentle agitating they feel has been done to them. They've been flipped upside down, but not in a violent way. And they also talk about letting go. So one of them relishes this idea of letting go her engineer identity and adopting a new leadership identity. But there's also some who really struggle with this. They feel the loss and wonder who are they going to become when they give up this engineer identity, for example. There's also a set of discourses that are more debilitating. So I see people on the program talk about being cut apart, being destroyed. And the problematic thing here is that it's the facilitators who the participants give the knife to do it to them. They ask the facilitators to cut them apart, but then feel um, incredibly victimized when it happened. Um, this, the second one slipping back, I've put in italics because it's different to that undoing literature I look at. So I want to try and extend that literature out. Slipping back refers to how um, in the pursuit of becoming a different person, we revert back to old identities. And the problem here is that participants castigate themselves whenever they revert back. So it becomes quite a destructive um, movement for them. And the last one is floundering. So some of them experience being shaken up and then they just get lost. They're not quite sure how to make sense of it. They feel like they've lost who they are and they're helpless. So even when the facilitators try to help them, they still don't know how to move forward. So my thesis looks at how are these created, who were involved in it, and what are the consequences. So I'm entering into my stage now of writing up my discussion chapter, and these are some of the propositions and questions I'm holding as I start to write this chapter. I'd like to position leadership development programs of places of both identity undoing and construction. I don't think we want leadership development programs that do one or the other. So coming back to that definition of develop, leadership development programs wrap up and they undo. They settle and they shake. They are places some people escape to, to deal with their undoing that happens in their organizational life. But they're also places people actively seek to become undone, 
because as Butler says, they're missing something. So a question for development becomes, how do you move between them? How do you design programs that can balance the tension of those two? I'm also wondering how can leadership development programs negotiate those debilitating forms of undoing? How can we, how can we deal uh, with undoing so that it doesn't end in self-destruction? And finally, though we may be undone by each other, I'm uncomfortable with the amount of participants who are placing that responsibility in someone else's hands and they're not taking upon the responsibility to self-undo or to actively resist that undoing. So, given that leadership development seems as though it's here to stay for at least the, the, the short while, I hope that my thesis shakes and opens up how we understand leadership development in a way that offers new alternatives in thinking. Thank you. Stunned into submission. Yeah, yes. That's a, that's a common um, assumption that you're either born to be a leader or you're not. Um, operating from a social constructionist paradigm assumes that nothing is fixed about your identity. So you're not born and therefore um, you, ha you have to stay within that track for the rest of your life. So this leadership development program I look at, um, they have a, a large number of academics working with them and they also teach to a social constructionist paradigm. So they believe that people can certainly be developed as leaders um, and that you can, uh, your, your identity is fluid and, and shifting. Yeah, yeah. Yes? Gender differences. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, <coughs> well, Bill mentioned that I assume that the more military thing, men behavior can be women, men be um, Right. Yeah, oh, okay, right, right, right. Gender differences, yes, I've, um, I've been schooled in gender theory, so it was an active decision of mine to not look at gender. Um, why did I decide not to? I felt that there wasn't enough gender stuff coming through. Um, undoing seems to be something that happens to both females and males. Um, in terms of even the destructive forms, there were certainly just as many males saying that they felt um, the, the pain of their character being just, just um, destroyed as females were. So I didn't, because I followed an inductive approach, which is to look at what the data is saying, and I didn't see much gender stuff, I decided to push that to the side for my thesis. But it's definitely on my post-PhD to-do list. I think there's some interesting stuff, particularly given that the facilitators are all female. Yes. Yes. Yep, yep. So facilitators are, they both design the program and then they run the residential workshops. They instigate a lot of this undoing, um, in particular one facilitator, and that's another thing my, my thesis looks at, is what are the implications of having one, per, one facilitator shouldered with the burden of having to undo people? Because there's moments where she felt quite isolated in that. Yes? Yes. And the kind of blind assumption that this is a very important mm. quality of organization to do the right quality of leadership. Mm. What's your view of that assumption? That yes. It's a very good question because it's been one of my biggest challenges, to be honest. I, um, and this talks to my letting go. I started my thesis thinking we should demolish leadership development and that it was symptomatic of all the ills within our society. So I had a really strong framing of these people are engineers of the human soul and there's power dynamics and it's just hideous. But I guess as I've gone through my, my field work, I've had to continually test that assumption because I have seen participants who have de developed in really remarkable, positive, amazing ways and they've been able to treat their staff in, 
in far better ways than they did before and they've opened up these incredible opportunities for themselves and negotiated their work-life balance in a far more um, sort of reasonable way. So I'm at the point now where I'm having to write, you know, coming into my discussion and I, nearly, I need to reframe all my literature because I've written it with that assumption that leadership development programs are really problematic and now I need to temper that to look at um, there is a place for these in society but that doesn't mean we shouldn't critique them or challenge them. Does that answer your question? I'm, I'm, my main concern with leadership development programs is that you're asking people to remove themselves from their organisational context, learn a whole new language and, and way of doing leadership and then inserting them back into that context which is often quite bureaucratic and doesn't allow for that translation and that's been a really big struggle for participants. So we need to, I'd love to do a study with organisations where we look at why are you sending people, how are you supporting them when they come back. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I think some who have struggled the most are ones. They're all they're all university educated. They're ones who have been um, taught in quite scientific disciplines. So the engineers and the doctors and the scientists should really struggle with this social constructionist approach that's asking them to look at their identity and experiment with who they are and most importantly to let go of that expert identity because for these people that's how they've succeeded is by, by becoming a really brilliant surgeon or brilliant engineer. So to be asked to let some of that go, that's been, you know, that's resulted in sort of floundering and withdrawal from the program. They've just said that's, I can't, I can't do that. Yeah, so definitely huge differences. Yes. No, sorry, it was a, it was a New, it's a New Zealand program, um, but my training was in Sweden. Yep. So in Sweden we have a university that's running a concurrent, <coughs> a concurrent research program. So I'm going there in December and we'll correlate some of our findings and see what's happening over in Sweden. Great, thank you.